Describe a day in your life. What's the process doing this every single day? Well, it's hard. You know, you wake up at, you know, whenever it is, seven or eight in the morning, and I immediately start working, at, you know, already have hundreds of emails. I got to read all the top stories of the day. And then as the day goes by, you go from reading to producing. You got to get the stories ready in order, production elements, etc. Then you do the show, which takes anywhere from three to four hours by the time we do the whole show. We do the post game for our members because our members get our whole podcast. Mm -hmm. We do sports segments, et cetera, et cetera. After the show is over, I go home. I have a meal with my wife and kid. And then I'm back to work. And around 10 or so, roughly, I'm back at my computer and I work till about one or two in the morning and just do it over and over and over again. It's nonstop. When you started, you were a three-person team creating three hours of content every day. That's a lot. How were you able to make that happen? Well, honestly, we A, worked harder. Yeah. <laughs> and B, uh, we had less production values. So if I had a long quote, instead of making a graphic out of it, I just look down, I, we don't have a prompter, I'd look down and I'd read the whole quote, right? Because we didn't have enough people to, to make a graphic. Mm -hmm. If our videos, we didn't have time to cut them down, so our videos would be like, let's say we're gonna rip apart Fox News, and they have a two and a half minute video. We'd just slump it on there, and I'd make comments while we were going along, which then turned into a whole thing, our play-by-play -play commentary, right? So we made do with what we had, and we did the best we could until we could do a little better. Well, yeah, you don't need all of this to start. You can't always think, look at this and be like, oh, I can't, I'm, I'm not there yet, so I'm just not going to begin at all. Like, if you want to compete with us, that's not true. You need all of this. You better not do it. Okay? <laughs> but in reality, seriously, of course you don't. You just, you start, don't try to make things perfect. Just start and then improve as you go along. That's the key to everything. The reason Anna books the guests, uh, does the on-air hosting, produces the, the second hour, yeah. et cetera, is because she has to. Like if we had a giant team of you know a hundred people, then she could just come in and take it easy and and do the show. But but we all got to chip in. I do a hundred different things. Dave, who runs the sh overall show, does the finance, the accounting, the website, customer service. Mm -hmm. He used to produce the show himself daily. It, everybody's got to do what they can to make it work. What advice can you give to people who want to do something like this? It's really simple. Just get started. That's it. Grab a camera. It doesn't matter if you're doing it in your kitchen. It doesn't matter where you're doing it. It doesn't matter how bad it is. And don't worry about people judging you or anything because once you go live, people are going to say this, that, and other thing. And everybody's called me every word in the book, right? Just get it up there and be open to change. Be open to doing it a little differently. Uh, respond to your audience. See what they say. And they're not always right, but they're often right. And one guy might not be right, but in collectively, the audience is almost always right, right? So listen to them and make the show better and better as you go along. Don't get intimidated by anything. Just get started. What about monetizing all of this? You've obviously created a business. This isn't just for fun anymore. How did you go about that, the business angle of this? Right. There's We have two main revenue streams. Mm -hmm. uh, one is our podcast. So if you want to get the whole show, mm -hmm. um, we have a free podcast on iTunes and Podcast Alley, etc. But that's only uh, two of our segments. If you want to get the whole show uh, and you want to get all the other shows, the sports show, movie review mm -hmm. show, etc., then you become a member of the youngturks.com and that's 10 bucks a month, but you get everything. And then you, so you don't need your radio anymore, et cetera. And people love that. If they like the show, they love the podcast. So people are willing to pay online? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. I remember when we first started, uh, the person who was in charge of uh, online for Sirius said, you will get 12 people to sign up. And I saw her at a party the other day and I said, by the way, we have 3,800 people, right? And she's like, damn. The second way we make money is of course through YouTube ads, mm -hmm. and uh, and we run ads on our on our views. And you know, on YouTube, unless you have a lot of views, it's tough to add up. But we do have a lot of views. We have 23 million a month, and that does add up, and that winds up being pretty good revenue. And then now, actually, the third thing that we've just begun is a partnership with Revision Three. They're fantastic at selling ads, so they're also selling sponsorships, etc. So now that's adding up to to a nice chunk, enough to make this whole thing work. Let's talk about the setup because it didn't start out like this. You started mm -hmm. with something very minimal, right. as you said, and let's talk about how it evolved. Right. Well, in the beginning, since we were radio, we just needed uh, you know, a mixer and an ISDN mm -hmm. line. That just gets you to New York where the series was broadcasting from and a couple of mics. And then as you do video, of course, you gotta buy cameras. And the better you do, the more cameras you can buy, 
give you a couple of different angles. So then one of the key things we had to do when we went online uh, is we had to buy a video switcher. And so that was a decent amount of money and then we had to build out the set a little bit. As you go along, you add program after program, programs for editing, you know, program for producing, etc. cetera. Uh, it's just been a slow build. Now, first of all, if you don't know this, it turns out all, making your video or movie or TV show, anything look good is 90% lighting. Who knew? Okay, so now we've always had terrible lighting in my opinion and in the opinion of the audience. <laughs> but we're trying to improve, we're trying to make it better, and recently we're like, oh, backlighting. Why didn't we think of that? It took us five years. So, but that's what I'm talking about when I say you don't have to start out perfect. I mean, and we don't know what we're doing. We're knuckleheads. We're just trying to figure it out as we go along, right? Yeah. And so it's okay if you just, look, we got the 380 million views on YouTube without any backlighting. Okay, so it's okay, and yeah. hopefully we'll make it better and, and and keep going and keep, you know, getting better and better. And that also proves it's a lot about the content. It's not about, I mean, quality is super important, and I think as YouTube evolves, to prove that there's good quality on YouTube is important. But if you have something to say and a story to tell that resonates, that's just as equally important. Right, well, actually, I think it's even more important because on TV, I think a lot of times they have it wrong. They, they don't want you to just look into the camera for too long. If it's over two minutes, they flip out. Yeah. They're like, oh my God, we got a new video, we got to do a guest, we got to zing, zang, zoom, right? Yeah. Whereas I think if you're talking to the camera, like I view it as somebody sitting at home watching this, right? And I want to tell them a story, and I think that's a lot more engaging. And whether it takes two minutes, five minutes, or 20 minutes, it depends on the story. And as long as you make it interesting, I think you draw the audience in. And I think that's much more important than anything you do, including backlighting.